This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sirah, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kalam Institute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. So continuing insha'Allah with our series on the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as seeratu nabawiyya in the previous sessions um So in the previous sessions we've been talking about the miraculous journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the night of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, the journey by night to Jerusalem and then the ascension above the heavens. In the previous session we talked about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reaching the point of Sidratul Muntaha, the highest point possible for any of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reach. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam going beyond there and prostrating, falling into sujood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there being given the gift of Salah, the gift of prayer. On his way back, of course, we talked about the conversation with Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu going back multiple times until the prayer kept being decreased by five, 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 until it finally reached the point of five prayers. And then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi said, I am happy, I am pleased with the decree of my Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the announcement that these are the five prayers that I have mandated, but they are still equal to 50 in their reward. After this, the Prophet ﷺ returned back and we talked about some of what he saw on his journey back from Jerusalem back to Mecca. When the Prophet ﷺ arrives, the narration describes to us that he arrives there, Qubayl al-Subh, very shortly before the Fajr time. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he goes to the Haram there, he meets Abu Jahl, or rather Abu Jahl sees him. And the narration described that the Prophet ﷺ was immediately overcome by this very strong wave of emotion. I mean, he had just experienced, you know, one of the things I mentioned was, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of making all of this happen in one night. But when you observe, when you read, when you study the journey of Al-Isra wal miraj in detail, the level of conversation, the level of detail, all the interactions the Prophet wasallam had, the be- a good way to understand it is that it is almost as if time froze during that time. And the Prophet wasallam. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how long of a time that was equivalent to. Was the time equivalent to a number of days? Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. But in human time, it basically all occurred within one night, between the time of Isha and Fajr. But because it was such a profound experience, the Prophet ﷺ had received such spiritual resolve and motivation, and it was so overwhelming of an experience to meet the Anbiya alayhim salam, to interact with the angels, to pray, not just at uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Bayt Al-Muqaddas, but to also then pray at Bayt Al-Ma'mur, and to then, you know, prostrate before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond Sidratul Muntaha, to take a tour of paradise, Jannah, to actually get a glimpse of the fire of hell. All these overwhelming experiences, and it was very spiritually refreshing and nourishing for the Prophet ﷺ, who had recently experienced the passing of his wife, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the passing, the death of his uncle Abu Talib, and then the journey of Ta'if. But as soon as the Prophet ﷺ arrived back in Mecca and he goes to the Haram and he looks around him and he sees Abu Jahl and all the Quraysh of Mecca, the reality sank in very quickly that I'm back here in Mecca and I'm back here amongst these people and these people will not believe, will not listen to a word I have to share with them. And so it was very overwhelming for the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Jahl sees him in this state and of course comes over mockingly, sarcastically and says, what's wrong? And the Prophet ﷺ explains to him what exactly transpired. He calls everyone there present at the Kaaba, at the Haram. They all gather around and the Prophet ﷺ explains to them what he just explained to Abu Jahl. And they start clapping and laughing and mocking the Prophet ﷺ. 
I talked about how Mutim bin Adi, uh, uh, you know, uh, a supporter of the Prophet ﷺ, even though he was a disbeliever, but he was a supporter up till now. In the boycott in the Shu'ab of Abi Talib, on, when he wanted to come back into Mecca after Ta'if, he had supported the Prophet ﷺ. Even he spoke very uh, disrespectfully to the Prophet ﷺ. And that's when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu spoke up, and he says that I attest to everything this man says to be the truth. And that's when they started challenging him. This is where we left off. So they said, you went to Masjid al-Aqsa, al-Masjid al-Aqsa, and the Prophet ﷺ said, na'am. Mutim bin Adi says it takes us a month to go there and a month to come back. How could you go there in one night and make it back? So then a few people there had actually been to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, so they said, describe it to us. Now like I mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ of course is the most intelligent human being that ever lived. So there was a lot that he just picked up. That there was a lot that he was able to retain, but at, of course he wasn't there studying the architecture of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He was there in the company of all the Prophets throughout time. So he started describing and then he started trailing off. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum say, we never saw the Prophet ﷺ at a loss of words. But because he's trying to define, explain, you know, the design and the structure. And then the narration says that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa was put in front of the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Sahaba actually relate that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, started describing it as if he was looking at it because he was looking at it. Then somebody piped in and they said, how many doors does Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa have? And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum say that the Prophet ﷺ started going like this. One, two, three, four, five. Like he was picking them out and counting them because he was looking at it. He, was, he could visualize it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that possible for him. And they started whispering amongst each other. The people who had been there, you know, everybody else is looking to them like, is this right? And then he started describing the doors. This door is on this side, it's this big. This door has this on it, this door has that on it. And the other one, the ones who had actually been there, look at the others who are looking to them and they, they start whispering amongst each other that he's absolutely like 100% correct. It's unbelievable. And you have to also understand the dynamic, right? We're talking about a very... It's, Mecca is a big city in terms of that time. But the Prophet ﷺ is a member of Quraysh. He's the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. He's the nephew of Abu Talib. His whole life and everything he's ever done in his life, everywhere he's ever gone in his life, is well known to everybody there. They know for a fact he has never been to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa before this night. So how is it that he's describing it with such detail? This is where I basically left off. Now they ask the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that what else did you see? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains to them, one narration says that one of them actually asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you went to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and came back, we have a caravan on the way, did you pass by them? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I passed by them. I absolutely did. I saw them. He said, what did you see? And he says that, he describes that they had one camel that had this sack that I explained last time that was hanging over the camel like you would have, you know, the middle part of the sack and then it hangs on both sides. And it's very unique because half of that one side of the sack was black and the other side was white. So it was very noticeable from even the sky where I, was tra where, I, uh, where I was traveling. And they look at each other and they say, that's absolutely right, we do have that. Then the Prophet of Allah وسلم, says that, أَتَيْتُ عَلَىٰ عِيرِ بَنِي فُلَانْ بِالرَّوْحَا قَدَ ظَلُّوا نَاقَةً لَهُمْ فَانْتَلَقُوا فِي طَلَبِهَا فَانْتَهَيْتُ إِلَىٰ رِحَالِهِمْ فَلَيْسَ بِهَا مِنُمْ أَحَدٌ Right, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, then basically says that, um, I also passed by another one of your caravans that had lost the camel and they were running around looking for the camel and I basically descended down and they had a pot full of water and I drank from that water. So then what happens is that they ask, okay, how far is it? He says, it was at Roha when I saw it last night. So they should be arriving here at any time. They should be getting here very, very soon. They should be here in no time. So they say, okay, 
we're in no hurry, we don't have anything better to do. No one's gonna move from here, we're not gonna go from here until that caravan arrives back. You say they should be here, we'll wait for them and then we'll confirm everything you have to say. We'll ask them if they lost a camel. We'll see if they had a pot full of water that they were carrying with them. We'll find out. So the narration says the Prophet ﷺ sat there, all of the Abu Jahl and the leaders of the Quraysh sat there. And the whole day went by and everybody just sat there and waited and waited and waited. And the narration describes that when the sunset time came close, like late Asr time, what we would consider. When that time came close, the Prophet ﷺ started to you know, get a little worried. Where is this caravan? If it doesn't come, they're gonna call me a liar. And so the Prophet ﷺ began to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, help me in this situation, don't make me look like a liar in front of them. And the narration describes that, the, even the people there, they describe that, that time when the colors start to appear in the sky, when Maghrib time becomes very close, and the colors appear in the sky, and usually what, it's 10-15 minutes and then the sun sets. They say very strangely, we've never experienced this before, but those colors in the sky lasted for a couple of hours. And the Prophet of Allah told the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has delayed the setting of the sun, because the, tra- the habit uh, at that time for these caravans was, if the sun was setting, then they would camp out wherever they were, they would not travel, even if they were right, to, right outside the city. They would just encamp there. And the sunset was delayed, very strangely, everyone was weirded out that, hasn't the sun been like right there for like two hours? But the setting of the sun was delayed. And then next thing you know, they, they're looking out at the horizon because they keep an eye on the sun, like why won't the sun set? And then they see the caravan arriving. And they all started looking at each other, like, what do we do now? The caravan's here. So no problem, go and ask them. And they go and they ask them, that did you lose a camel? And they say, yeah, we lost the camel. How did you know we lost the camel? Who told you we lost the camel? Somebody get here before we did? No, everybody's here. Nobody that was with us is over here. We, we, have, we did a full count, a head count. We got everybody. How would you know that we lost the camel? And they all start looking at each other. And then they ask them, did you have a pot full of water? And he goes, yeah, actually we do. And he said, you know what's really interesting about that? It's funny you bring up that pot full of water. Because what I did was, the guy who was in charge of making sure that there was water for the caravan, he says, I had just filled it up, and I had loaded it onto the camel, and then we all went out searching for this camel that we had lost, the naqa that was lost. And when I came back, the water was less than what I had left it. And I just figured that maybe the camel moved while I was gone and some of it had spilled out. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that was me, you're welcome. Right? And it was remarkable, everyone was completely blown away. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat to the Prophet وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ That this vision and this experience. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, when mentioning this ayah, in the tafsir of this ayah, Imam Bukhari uh, rahimahullah ta'ala mentions that the word ru'ya here doesn't refer to a dream. Like the Qur'an it says, inni arafil manam. The Qur'anic word that is used for a dream, typically in this type of a situation, dreams of prophets, is al-manam. But the, the word here, ru'ya, actually refers to everything the Prophet ﷺ saw, everything that he learned. Ru'ya is also in the meaning of like understanding something, learning something, realizing something. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ That this, this experience that we gave to you, we did not make it except as a fitna for the people, a test for the people. This will serve as a filter for the people that are present at your time. That when you come back and you tell them this experience, this will filter and sort the people out. You will see the people that will not believe no matter what happens, what transpires and what you tell them, they will not believe. And there are some that will hear this and they will only increase them in their faith, in their iman, in their belief. And one of those people was of course Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that as the Prophet kept mentioning, you know, fact after fact after fact, 
Even before it was confirmed, that's why he was even telling them all of these details, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala was sitting there and he kept saying, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet sallallahu turned to him and he says, Anta siddiq you are the truthful. And that's when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala was given this title of as-Siddiq. And this basically concludes the, the story of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. Now there's a couple of details I want to mention here, and then I want to mention the immediate aftermath of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj tonight. Because it's very important and it's very relevant to us and for us. So a couple of details that I wanted to mention that I alluded to a little bit earlier when we started studying al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, is that there's, a, there's quite a bit of discussion amongst the scholars about... Or rather I should say there's, there's some discussion among some of the scholars about the night of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj and some of the specific details. These are, there is a majority, overwhelming majority position and opinion. Let me explain to you what that is. That opinion is that there were two parts to this journey, Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, the journey by night from Mecca to Jerusalem and the ascension above the heavens. Both portions of the journey occurred on the same night. This is the majority position of the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That the both parts of the journey occurred on the same night, number one. Number two, both parts of this journey were a physical journey the Prophet ﷺ undertook, while of course being mentally, spiritually aware and conscious. But this was also a physical journey that the Prophet ﷺ took. And both of them occurred on one night. This is the majority position. There are a few minority opinions, but those are extremely shad, which is basically the Arabic technical word for something being such an obscure opinion that it really holds no weight or no value in the Islamic discourse. And some of those opinions are that the, there are two parts to this journey, al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, and some scholars hold the position that al-Isra going to Jerusalem and coming back took place on one night, and then Mi'raj going from Mecca straight up into the heavens took place on another night. But that's a minority position not accepted by the majority of scholars. Number two, an extremely small minority has also held the position that the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, Al-Isra was a physical journey, but the journey from Jerusalem up into the heavens, Al-Mi'raj, that was more of just a spiritual journey that was taken, that his consciousness and his, his heart basically, it was a spiritual journey, like his soul took this journey, but his body stayed there at the place of Jerusalem. This is not accepted by the vast overwhelming majority of the scholars of this ummah. And then of course there is an extremely small minority um, that is also an extreme group that held such beliefs that actually took them outside of the realm of Islam, that the Mu'tazila in such groups that over-rationalized every aspect of the religion, ayat of the Qur'an, a hadith of the Prophet anything that did not make sense to them, in their rationale and logic, they just denounced it, or they said it's an allegory for something else. They were of the opinion and position that this entire journey, al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, was just a dream that the Prophet ﷺ had. And of course again, that's not a reliable position, according to the vast overwhelming majority of this ummah, 99.99% that the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah doesn't give any credence to that particular position. These were just a few details I wanted to kind of elaborate on. Now let's talk about the immediate aftermath. So the first day after the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returns back, the first day that the Prophet ﷺ returns back from the journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, of course it ta- the whole dialogue with Quraysh takes place. But there, now whether this happened on that same exact day and the Prophet ﷺ would just excuse himself, or this happened the following day, there's a difference of opinion, it's a different historical account. But a day, the next day afterwards, or a day after the Prophet ﷺ returned back from this journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, at the time of Zawal. Zawal is the peak of the sun, what's called the zenith. It's the sun when it reaches its peak. At the time of Zawal, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he tells him to gather the believers. And they go to the Haram, to the Kaaba. And the Prophet ﷺ brings a group of believers with him. Jibreel alayhi salam, explains to the Prophet ﷺ that we are going to pray now. Those five, t- five prayers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated upon you and your ummah, I'm going to give you a crash course on those salawat. 
and basically what is required in terms of them. Now before we even go here, what we need to talk about is, what was the salah that was already present before this? There are, diff- there are different opinions. There is a majority position, a minority position. The majority position of the scholars, based off of a lot of narrations from the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, is that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray regularly before this. Of course, that's an established fact, that the fact that he used to pray. But the majority position is, before this journey of al-Isra wal miraj whenever the Prophet ﷺ would pray, he would pray in units of two. Raka'atan, raka'atan, which is called a shafa'ah. Alright, units of two, pairs. He would just pray two rak'at, he would do taslim, then he would pray two more rak'at, he would do taslim. So no matter how many rak'at he prayed in total, he used to pray in only units of two. There were no threes, there were no fours. A minority of position of scholars said, no, the Prophet ﷺ would also pray four before al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, but the reliable position is that he used to pray two. Now Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ gathers the believers. Jibreel alayhi salam tells him that Command, they used to pray in congregation and group even before this, so they were familiar with the format, but they stand up in a line. Jibreel alayhi tells the Prophet ﷺ, you will be leading them, but I will be leading you in prayer. So that I can demonstrate for you what exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, has ordained in terms of the prayers. The Prophet Jibreel alayhi salam began to pray. The Prophet ﷺ was standing to the next of him, like if two people pray together, jama'ah, they stand next to one another. The Prophet ﷺ was standing next to Jibreel alayhi salam, and there was a row of believers that were praying behind the Prophet ﷺ because they can't see Jibreel alayhi salam. But that was instructed. By the way, from this, this is a very unorthodox method of prayer, right? It's like having two imams and then having a congregation. This is part of the evidence in the dalil. This is the evidence for if we, are con- if we are teaching people to pray, and you create a little bit of an unorthodox you know, structure or layout of the prayer in order to teach people, whether they be children or converts or whatever the case may be. If it is done to and linnas, if it is being done to educate people, then the prayer can be offered in a more unorthodox format. Let me give you an example. A lot of times in an after school program or on the weekend school in the masjid, sometimes they'll have one, you know, one of the students stand up and lead all the other students in the prayer. And ta'aliman, for the education of the children, the, the student that is leading the prayer will recite everything in the prayer out loud. You might have seen the children do that sometimes. So when he goes into ruku' Allahu Akbar, he's saying Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, he's saying that out loud. And a lot of times we see that and we're like, oh brother, like you know, what is he doing? You know, he's, not, he's performing prayer wrongly. And honestly sometimes people come to me with these questions like, is this permissible or not? This is the evidence, this is the proof of the fact that if you are doing it to educate people, just to teach them, because they don't know. So if you have a friend, if, you, if somebody has recently taken their shahada, or maybe never prayed in their life, they're just learning how to pray for the first time in their life, and you have them stand next to you, and you recite everything out loud, at lillahi was salawatu, you're reciting everything out loud, so they can listen to it, and start to pick it up, then you're doing it for the purposes of ta'aleem, and this is permissible. So anyways, getting back to the narration, the Sahaba are standing, the Prophet is standing in front of them, and the next to him is Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam is leading Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the prayer. And they pray, they start with dhuhr. As soon as the zawal begins, they pray dhuhr. And so the narration actually describes, Ammani Jibreel, uh, Ammani Jibreel, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, <clears throat> Ammani Jibreel عند البيت. Oh, in the Babel Bait, near the door of the Kaaba. Marratain. Two, two days in a row, Jibreel alayhi salam led me in prayer. Day number one. Fasalla bi al dhuhr hina zalat al shams. Wa kanat qadr al shirak. The first day, Jibreel alayhi salam led me in prayer as soon as the sun started its decline from its peak. Which is, which, which, I'm going to simplify it in terms, which is what we will call the beginning time of dhuhr. So the Adhan time of Dhuhr, let's just say it's like 117, right? At that time, that's when Jibreel alayhi salam led me in Dhuhr, and I prayed, and the believers, they prayed behind me. Then we all dispersed, we went about our business, then Jibreel alayhi salam called me back. وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْعَصَرِ حِينَ صَارَ ظِلُّ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مِثْلَهُ 
Then he, we reassembled when the shade of everything was equal to one length of the thing. So for instance, this microphone, when the shade of the microphone was equal to its length, Dhuhr time is done, Asr time has started, then we reassembled and Jibreel salam led me in Asr prayer, four rakat, four in Dhuhr, four in Asr here. وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْمَغْرِبِ حِينَ أُفْطِرَ الصَّائِمِ And the Prophet ﷺ remembers the time by saying that he then we reassembled and he led me in Maghrib prayer and I led the believers in Maghrib prayer at the time when a fasting person would break their fast. Which proves that optionally they used to fast before this as well. No Ramadan, it wasn't Ramadan at that time. But they used to optionally fast at that time. And some even mentioned that the fast of Ashura were already obligatory, mandatory at that time. Even though some of the scholars say, no, they, those also became mandatory once they made the migration to Medina. But nevertheless, they used to fast from time to time. So the Prophet says, when the sun set, when a fasting person would break their fast, he led me in Maghrib prayer. وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْعِشَاء حِينَ غَابَ الشَّفَقْ And then as soon as the, the faint little bit of you know light in the horizon was completely gone these are the natural markers of the times of prayer we can't actually observe a lot of them because of all the pollution and lights and everything that we have we're not able to really observe a lot of them you know it's it's maybe it's a beneficial experience sometimes drive out to the middle of nowhere like Oklahoma and um, you know maybe kind of experience that practice the sunnah inshallah alright and so when it became fully dark and the stars became apparent then we reassembled and he led me in Isha so Maghrib he led me in three Isha he led me in four Fara'id then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْفَجْرِ then the next morning we reassembled and he led me in the Fajr prayer حِينَ حَرُمَ الطَّعَامُ وَالشَّرَابَ عَلَى الصَّائِمِ at the time when eating and drinking would become impermissible for a fasting person, which is the time of Fajr, the break of dawn. At the beginning time of Fajr, he led me in prayer. These are five, two raka'at, these are five salawat. But then the Prophet ﷺ says it was not over. فَلَمَّا كَانَ الْغَدْ Then the next day, صَلَّى بِيَ الظُّهُرْ حِينَ كَانَ ظِلُّهُ مِثْلَهُ Then the Prophet ﷺ says he led me in dhuhr prayer when the shade of everything was close to being equal to its size. Which in simple language is what we would call what? The end time of Dhuhr. Like he led me in prayer five minutes before Asr started. I'll explain the wisdom in this. And then he says, وَفِي لَوْذْكَ وَقْتِ الْعَصْرِ بِالْأَمْسِ Or, وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْعَصْرِ حِينَ كَانَ ظِلُّهُ مِثْلَيْهِ then he led me in Asr prayer when the, when the shade of everything was twice its size. Which is what we would call the, towards the end of the time of Asr. Not absolutely the end time. Because the Prophet in another narration has told us that praying once you know, the sun has started to set and the sky has turned like yellow, at that time Asr fihi karaha. The Prophet ﷺ said that that is, that is not good to delay Asr till that time. That takes away the reward of the prayer. So when the shade of everything was double its size, so it's later in the Asr prayer, right before the sky starts to really change its colors, then he led me in Asr prayer at that time, which is what, what we would call towards the end of the time of Asr. وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْمَغْرِبِ حِينَ أُفْطِرَ الصَّائِمِ But he led Maghrib at the same exact time. As soon as the sun set, when a fasting person would break their fast, he led me in a Maghrib prayer. Maghrib, no second time. Same time. We'll talk about this. وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْعِشَاء إِلَى ثُلُثِ اللَّيْلِ الْأَوَّلِ And he led me in the Isha prayer when a third of the night had passed. A third of the night had passed. Alright, which for us would be around this time of the year would maybe be around like, you know, 11.30, maybe at the maximum 12 o'clock. At that time, he led me in Isha prayer at midnight. Alright, again, that's not, there's a difference of opinion about whether that is the end time of Isha or not, but he definitely led me in Isha at a very, very late time. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَصَلَّى بِيَ الْفَجْرِ فَأَسْفَرَ And then he led me in Fajr prayer the next morning again. But this time he led me in the Fajr prayer, once it had started to get a little bit brighter outside. This is not the sun rising, 
But it started to get a little bit brighter. Which basically the way to figure out the time of Isfar is, if you take the time of Fajr, from the break of dawn until the sun begins rising, and if you cut that time in half, he led me at that half time point. He led me in Salat al-Fajr at that particular point. And then he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ Then he turned towards me after we finished Salat al-Fajr. فَقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ هَذَا وَقْتُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَالْوَقْتُ مَا بَيْنَ هَذَيْنِ Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the time of the prayers of the Prophets before you. These are the times of the prayers of the Prophets before you. وَالْوَقْتُ مَا بَيْنَ هَذَيْنَ And I led you on two days, in, a, in the case of four different prayers, not Maghrib, but four different prayers, I led you at two different times to let you know, that is the window of Salah. That is the time frame of salah. That is a window of opportunity in terms of each prayer. For dhuhr, uh, when, the, when the sun begins its decline till the shade of everything is equal to its length, the time of asr, from when it is equal to the length, one size of its length, the shade, to when it is twice its size, Maghrib on the same time, and the fa'idah, the benefit of this, the lesson from this is, Maghrib must be prayed immediately. The time of Maghrib is immediate. And that is emphasized through the practice of Rasulullah wasallam and through the instruction of Jibreel wasallam, which is coming directly from Allah. The time of Isha from when it becomes completely dark outside until when a third of the night has passed. And then Salatul Fajr from the break of dawn till when the light starts to appear outside, that is the window for praying Salatul Fajr. And this is basically what occurred on that next day and the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam performed the prayer in this particular form and taught it to the ummah and this is the moment from on forward that the five times daily prayer was ordained I told you about the narration of before the opinion that Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim rahimahumallah ta'ala bring the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uftridat his salatu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam awwala ma uftridat raka'atayni raka'atayni kulla ثُمَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَتَمَّهَا فِي الْحَضَرِ أَرْبَعًا وَأَقَرَّهَا فِي السَّفَرِ عَلَى فَرْضِهَا الْأَوَّلْ رَكَعَتَيْنَ عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها says, and this is متفق عليه, that originally when the prayer was mandated, قبل الإسراء والمعراج, before الإسراء والمعراج, it was two two raka'at. And then when the salah came, it came in its proper form. ثُمَّ أَتَمَّهَا اللَّهَ then it was three in Maghrib, four for Dhuhr, four for Asr, and uh, uh, four in Isha. It was made more complete. And that was the way that a local person, a resident would pray. But then in Safar, it was cut back down to its original form of two. For the ease and the gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the things I forgot to mention in the narration is that even when we pray, we, we, you probably, well everybody here knows of course inshallah that in Salat al-Fajr when we pray, we recite out loud in both the raka'at. Right? Fi raka'atain. In both the, the units, the imam or you know, the imam recites out loud. In Dhuhr and Asr, he does not recite out loud. In Maghrib, in the first two, he recites out loud. And in Isha, in the first two, he recites out loud. That is what Jibreel alayhi salam did. And that is then what the Prophet sallallahu also did for uh, the Ummah. And so that was also done on that day that the timings of the prayer were explained and elaborated upon and laid out. Then on that same exact day, which raka'at are to be recited out loud in, and which raka'at are recited silently, and was also demonstrated on that same exact day. So what we basically understand is this, the, take, the takeaway message from this narration is two things I want to emphasize. Number one is that at the in conclusion of this unbelievable, there are so many lessons in the story of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. One, one of the great scholars who wrote uh, the very you know, uh, detailed work of Sirah, Subulul Huda wa Rashad, uh, Imam Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Salihi al-Shami, um, who's written the very detailed work uh, on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, Subulul Huda wa Rashad. He's written about a hundred pages on just the fawaid, the lessons, the reflections that we can take from the journey of the Prophet ﷺ on the night of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj. It is a powerful experience from the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we can learn so much from. And that's why it's taken us almost five, six, seven sessions to just complete this one 
event from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Having said that, at the conclusion of it, what's the absolute conclusion of this unbelievable profound experience? What's the conclusion of it? Five times daily prayer. It all boils down to, it all concludes with, it all finally ends with the five salawat. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. And that might unfortunately, very unfortunately, seem very anticlimactic to somebody. But we have to see the beauty and the significance in that. And that's where there's that narration that some of the scholars have, you know, talked about the, the, some of the weakness of the isnad. But the scholars have said that thabata ma'anahu, the meaning of it is something that the scholars of this ummah have overwhelmingly established and confirmed. And in fact, the scholars say that this narration comes through so many different isnad that it is strengthened to the point where we can accept it, where the Prophet ﷺ says, As-salatu mi'arajul mu'min. Salah, prayer is the mi'raj, is the ascension, is that profound spiritual experience, rejuvenation for each and every single believer. That if we want to have the experience that the Prophet ﷺ had on the night of Isra wal Mi'raj, we can achieve that same profound experience through the prayer, through the salawat. And so salah is the conclusion. Salah was the gift. Salah was the message that was brought back. Salah was the practical you know, takeaway from this night. Salah was, was what was put into practice when this night concluded. It was, it was prayer, it was salah. It was all building up to this particular point. And from that point on, the Prophet ﷺ never needed another journey of al-Isra wal Mi'raj. No matter how difficult the situation and circumstance became, إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزَعَ إِلَى salah. Because from that point on, whenever any situation arose in the life of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, he would immediately at once go to prayer. Prayer provided that same spiritual rejuvenation, that same connection to Allah, that same relief that the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj provided. And we've been given that same opportunity. We can live that same experience through our salah, through our prayer. By conversing with Allah, by talking to Allah. Even we talked about the night when the Prophet ﷺ reaches the highest point that any human being, any creation of Allah, when the Prophet ﷺ comes closer to Allah than any creation of Allah has ever gotten to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he crosses beyond a Sidratul Muntaha that no creation of Allah has ever crossed beyond. What does he do there? He performs sujood. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says in an authentic narration, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجُدُ The closest that the slave is to his Lord and his master is when he's in sujood. Another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says that when a person does sajda, sujood, their head is in the feet of Ar-Rahman. That is the experience of salah. And we've been granted that powerful experience. It is our job, it is our responsibility, it is upon us to really seize that opportunity. To really make the most of that. And this, to some extent, to those who maybe have heard me speak on the topic before, might kind of sound like, you know, a broken record. But I traveled for the last five years, all throughout the US and even Canada and UK, you know, just talking about this topic. Meaningful Prayer was the name of the class, but it was about this topic. Because we know salah, we know how to perform like the basic physical elements of the prayer, but there's that experience that's missing. And a lot of times it's due, it's a lack of quality is all it is. People talk about khushur, that's exactly what it is. But people get intimidated by even the word khushur. Especially if you say with tajweed, khushur. Can you imagine like Havid Wissam saying khushur? Right, it'd be scary. So it intimidates people. And people get scared. It's a lack of quality in the prayer. Well, what do you have to do to fix the quality? You just have to apply yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed everyone, every single person, with the gifts, with the talents, with the abilities necessary to achieve quality in our prayers. And what do we need to do? Step number one, one of the first things I emphasize is to first understand what is prayer? What does prayer mean to a person? And this is what prayer needs to mean to us. This is what it should mean to us. Number two is to learn how to pray. Now somebody might say, brother, I know how to pray. You stand, Surah Fatiha, another Surah, Ruku, Subhanahu Bil Azim, Sami Allah, Nabi Hamida, Rabbana Kaham, Allahu Akbar, Sujood, Subhanahu Bil Allah, Sallallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Subhanahu Bil Allah, Allahu Akbar, Tahiyatul Layl, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I know how to pray, brother. But when I, when I say that, learn how to pray. There's a there's a big piece of the puzzle that's missing. 
Do we understand what we're saying in the prayer? Do we comprehend what we're actually reading in the prayer? Some of us have been doing it for, you know, 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years of our lives. Do we understand what we're saying? And somebody says, no brother, I don't, but I don't got eight months to go learn Arabic at the Arabic program. I, I, don't, I don't got it. Well, that's the thing. We need focus. Inshallah, we'll all learn Arabic one day. But at the very least, learn the meaning of what you're reading in the prayer. And that's something I've been able to teach in a class within one weekend. All you have to do is go at the very least pick up a book that's got the prayer and the translation of everything you read in prayer and just read through that. At least gain some level of comprehension about what you're reading. How much time would that take? An hour? Two hours? Three hours? That's the length of a football game. That's all. You gotta sacrifice one football game and you'll know what you're saying in your prayer. And the, the, the level of quality, the experience that prayer becomes is life-changing, life-altering. And then the second point that I wanted to make here, about quality in the prayer and achieving this experience, think about, think about the arrangements that were made. Think about the arrangements that were made in order to teach us the times of the prayer. Jibreel alayhi salam comes, leads the Prophet ﷺ in prayer for two days. It's a training exercise on the timing, just to communicate to us, not just the number of raka'at, but more importantly, because the number of raka'at could be explained in 60 seconds. The fara'id, two in fajr, four in dhuhr, four in asr, three in maghrib, four in isha, done. 15 seconds. But one of the bigger parts of this whole equation was to teach us, to elaborate to us, to demonstrate for us the timings of the prayer. And that's a big part of having quality in our prayer, is to observe the time of the prayer. That's a big takeaway lesson from this. That we have to become particular about the time of the prayer. There's, everyone's got a situation. Everyone's got something going on. Somebody's got work, somebody's got school, somebody's got kids, somebody's got this, somebody's got that. But that's where the effort and the struggle comes in. But when we still make the effort, when we still make the struggle, at least get five minutes on the side to find a corner in the time of the prayer, the actual time of the prayer. Not that I'll just pray everything when I get back home at night. But when I step aside for even five minutes, just pray my fara'id. For the person who's not even praying, just step aside for five minutes and just pray your fard. But pray it on time. You'll yourself experience and appreciate how profound of an experience it becomes. How meaningful your, not just your prayer, but your day, your life becomes. How organized your schedule becomes. How you long, you look forward to that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start checking your watch to see if it's a time, is it time, is it time. You long for that experience. So the, the conclusion of the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj is salah, prayer. Well, that might seem very simple, it's unbelievably profound. And it's an experience that we all need to achieve, that we all need to have, that we all need and we require, that we must have. And so that's, if somebody is motivated by hearing about the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, somebody is touched by this experience of the Prophet ﷺ, somebody is overwhelmed by learning about this, then implement that, act on that, live that same experience by performing salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant us all the ability to pray, to pray with quality, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turn our salah into an experience, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with khushur in our prayer. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasafir wa natubu ilayk. From next week, inshaAllah, what we're going to talk about is, it's, it's all very, you know, it's not by coincidence. From next week on forward, the next phase in the life of Rasulullah ﷺ is, he comes across these people who, co who come and who actually listen to him from this small little farm town called Yathrib. A small group of people come and actually listen to him. And this was the beginnings of Medina. So we'll start talking about the Ansar and the people of Medina from next week inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.